I've done some difficult things in my time gaming, mostly in the name of trophies, achievements, or just bragging rights with friends over defeating a boss. Elden Ring comes to mind in recent times. However, Dead Rising 7 Day Survivor Challenge has now taken my top spot for the most horrific ordeal I have ever gone through. Bear in mind this is from someone who has already platinumed PUBG on the PS4 and Dead by Daylight on the PS5, back to back with endless bugs and grinds in that mix. Nevertheless, this near infinite ordeal for Dead Rising's most mystical achievement lasted just over 14 hours in real life. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. Equaling seven days in-game time I spent with Frank in Willamette. It's a good job I had a whole Sunday free to do sweet F all. But what makes this so hard to hear you sneer? No way can it be that bad. Well, buckling sceptics, because this one is a wild one. Well, unlike the game's 72 hour main mode, which is story driven with optional survivors and boss fights, where eating or drinking simply replenishes your life if you get a chunk taken out of you by a zombie, Infinity Mode, as it's known, is an entirely different beast, challenging the player to be pushed to their limits. You unlock this mode after getting the true ending of Overtime Mode, and the S ending. And there's a reason it's the ultimate challenge for a Dead Rising fan. You can't save, you can't quit, you can't die, and your health is constantly draining. Meaning, your number one priority is food just like real life. Every survivor you saved is now an enemy, and it also drops items like food and weapons from a spinning cardboard box that Snake would be proud of. Psychopaths now spawn in random places on different days too, and sometimes even twice, three times, making your days far more unpredictable until you study their spawn times and have multiple runs. All of this, though, is a benefit to you, if you find a good strategy with some clock watching, you can use their appearances to sustain Frank's need for orange juice and pies. This ultimately means one mistake in the game, you're done. It's over. You get stuck in a horde and die? Yikes. The power goes off at home and turns your console off? Best get restarting after you've wiped those tears away from your cheeks. Or that annoying sibling or cousin just turns your console off for a laugh? you're probably going to end up going to prison with the rage filling your soul up. You get it. It's one and done. It takes dedication. It's a test of endurance, mental stability, memory, and a test of your patience bar anything else. It's also incredibly boring because you'll spend 70% of your time waiting. Which is why I want to make this video as snappy and to the point as possible. There are so many guides online, but ultimately, I watched a mix of these, read up a load of info, and enjoyed some random events in my own mix to build this video for you today as a sort of safety guide. But anyway, enough of me yapping about what we're going to do. Let me show you my experience and prevent you needing much needed therapy. It all begins with this. Day one is extremely important. If you don't set yourself up right and get yourself some early in-game food, you will be setting yourself up to fail. So don't say I didn't advise you. So, once you get into the mall, you need to find yourself three important items. The food and health related magazines. These are in the main game, but you don't generally need them, but in this mode, they're going to boost all your food and drink item needs, to the max, allowing more bang for your book. The specifics for this can easily be found online, but I'll let you know that they're essentially just in the bookstores, and one is in that off little shoot room in the North Plaza where you rescued some survivors in the main game. Once you've got those three, you're good to go. Now, the main thing you want to do here is to go outside into the central park. You will be greeted with the family of snipers you've seen before. Do not be too intimidated or foolish here. 
use the trees and shoot back or get close with melee weapons. Now these guys are generally tricky, but by this point of attempting 7 day survivor, you should be 100% level 50 and ideally have the mega buster from killing 53,000 so 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 many zombies. My advice, if not, is to head to the gun shop regularly in the North Plaza if you do lack that firepower. If you don't, well, you may struggle with this entire challenge to be honest. Once you've taken out those three psycho snipers, they will drop pizzas and fruit. Hold on to the fruit, but gather all the food outside in that area too. In the benches, near the trees, everywhere you can see. Then head to the wooden rooftop. Drop all those items, especially the cooked steak and pizza, because we have a big weight on our hands, and they will rot in 15 minutes if you don't put them out of your inventory. Luckily, with this weight, you have the central clock tower. FYI, you may want to set up Netflix or YouTube binges during this entire challenge because the waiting periods will make you lose your mind. Lastly, before you begin your wait fully, set a timer on your phone or PC for about 18 minutes. It gives you two minutes leeway in case anything's going wrong because Frank's health will just about drain to one block by then, giving you enough time to consume some items of food, orange juice, coffee cream and milk, pizzas and steaks, and some of the cocktail mixers will fill your entire health bar. So they are your gold mine for this challenge, assuming you have those magazines we mentioned earlier, as it will triple boost them. Your first proper goal at around 9am to 11am on day one, make your way into the North Plaza, specifically the Chrislip store, where you fought Cliff in the main game. This is where you'll find your first survivor to kill. Now, do not underestimate Bill. He will shoot you the moment you enter, so make sure you have some spare food just in case. Once he's dead, he will drop Cliff's machete and some ice cream. Both equally good pieces of loot to start your journey off. Also bear in mind that you need the killing blow on the survivors or psychos for the box to spawn and drop the goodies. If you don't and you use zombies to basically cheese them, you may lose out. So head back to the roof spot we had and go and watch something while monitoring your health via the timer. We got a few more in-game hours to kill here. Before long, it will reach around 2 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon on your first day, and it's time to grab what food you have left and head back into Paradise Plaza. We have another victim on the menu. Dana will spawn back in one of the kids' shops, and she will be easy pickings, trust me. Kill her, steal her veggies, and relax for a moment. There is also a clock inside this section of the mall to keep track of your time, as yeah, your wristwatch is disabled in infinity mode if you hadn't noticed, and time management is very important. Right about now, the reality of the challenge ahead of you will begin to sink in, and this is your fight or flight. Like me, you will easily get bored and start finding things to do to occupy your time. You may even be able to sneak in other trophies during your downtime. It's totally up to you, as this guide is pretty malleable as long as you keep track of when food is needed. Either way, it's time for a pit stop at the security room, the safest place in the mall, for now. Refresh your blaster, if you have it, and keep a keen eye on the clock while waiting somewhere safe. After a few more in-game hours, it's time for quite an important section and end-game of your first day. As soon as that clock hits around 7 to 8 p.m., you want to head down to Wonderland Plaza, making sure to use the female toilet shortcut you unlocked in the main game. Thank you Capcom Overlords for allowing us to use this infinity mode because if not, damn. Once there, head towards the bottom end of the ride. A familiar face will lunge out at you, and depending on your weapons, it could go one way or another. Adam will drop two mini chainsaws, which can be quite valuable, but more importantly, he drops an exotic Japanese radish, and we all love those. Now this is an optional risk for what we have next. If you want to take the chance on more high-end food items and a decent weapon, we need to head out to Leisure Park again, 
and down into the maintenance tunnels. Travel back to where you fought Larry in the main game and be prepared to spam him with buster shots or a decent gun because this is your first serious run killer. Between the zombies outside, Carlito's van, the zombies inside and Larry, the entire place is a damn death trap. But the rewards are fantastic. Spitfire, your first mixer, you know, one of those cocktail type drinks is dropped here. And outside of the benefit known to you, you also get that full health benefit. So it's a worthy task to complete for keeping Frank's hunger at bay, as well as other food items being in there like milk. This is where you can happily wait for a good few in-game hours, towards day two, or choose to freely explore for other survivors and more food. However, once the more food is gone, it's gone, it won't respawn. So try and stay clear of the majority of it until day four or five. It's up to you ultimately, but this guide is designed to be playing as safe as possible, sticking with the fights over foraging, with the risk versus rewards. I personally chose to run to the movie theatre at this point for another bonus survivor. Reflecting on this though, I would not recommend it, as I only ended up with a soggy rotting lettuce. Make your choice, soldier. To finish off our day, we have the chance at one more psychopath carrying goodies for us to rummage off their corpse. You will want to head back to the security room firstly, though, refill your buster and relax with a few more in-game hours till around 9 or 10pm. Once the clock strikes around then, head out to the normally welded door to the entrance plaza and prepare yourself for another fight with Carlito. Sniper Carlito. Another run ender here, if you go in unprepared but the buster can pretty much spam his ass from a distance so don't be too worried and while diving in and out of the shops it can keep you safe. So do what works for you, once I killed him you will get more high end food to keep you tromping along. I waited quite a few in game hours before going to Alfresca to fight Isabel next. This area is a nightmare at the best of times and she has a bike to boot. There's no real strategy here other than spray, dodge and pray. Once she is down, barricade yourself into one of the food stalls or head to the gym with all the food you've got and all the ones you can muster up. This is one of the big weights in the game and you will be able to watch a movie in the meantime, trust me. The challenge might be feeling also like a slog at this point. Day 2 is dawning on us pretty fast and I was getting bored so I started throwing plates at zombies and running to check the clock and pause, get some water, get a snack, come back and we just need to wait till 5 to 6 a.m. on day two before we get going for the next section of this run. At this point you have some experience of what's to come based on what you've done so far. So let out a big sigh we have one fight coming up straight away and then some more eating. It's not the most strenuous thing. Head over to the food court next, being careful of the rafters above where we will find our second Carlito, with his P90 machine gun in tow. Be extra careful of the zombies here and try to get your buster on him from one of the seating dining areas because once he's down you can head straight up to him steal his steak and settle in for a few more hours. We've got more time to kill and at this point you should have plenty of munch for Frank to chow down on for a good few in-game hours. Remember that alarm, do not forget how quickly it goes down. Now after some waiting it's time to head out once again and check the nearest clock. So pop into the park and make sure it's at least 10am roughly. The convicts may have spawned by now, FYI, but do not engage. It is not worth it, trust me, especially if you're already struggling with this challenge. They will end your run just by looking at you. So we head to Paradise Plaza and we'll find our photography friend. Now, Kent can be a real ass depending on what weapons you're using. Even with the buster, he can catch you out sometimes, so keep your distance. Between skill and zombie RNG, this is a difficult one. 
and you really don't want your run being ended by the Shermanator when we're halfway into day two. Once he is disposed of, you will get plenty of treats for your time. Coffee creamer and a steak, my favourite, just wouldn't have them together. You should be right outside Jill's sandwiches too, a lovely Capcom easter egg. So head in there, drop your spoilable food at the floor, barricade yourself with some stools, and take a nice little nap. There is extra baguettes and orange juice in here too, but try and hold off using them if you can. Our waiting game is going to continue, and most of day two tends to be waiting. After almost being a Jill sandwich ourselves, it's time to head back out to the security room for a few odd jobs. Firstly, refresh your buster, do not forget, and also on the way, you may come across Beth depending on what time you leave. Another survivor in the hallway we can nab some extra snacks from. Every little helps, remember, Tesco doesn't lie. Plus I wanted to make a little outfit change to something a little less sensible and more fun. Then we play the waiting game from around 5pm on day 2. But do not despair everyone, we are nearly at day 3. And after a little bit more time, we can make our way back to the movie theatre. And I chose to complete my Mega Man outfit before going to take out Jonathan, a machine gun armed survivor in one of the back screens. He does drop some lovely milk, which as we know by now is the gold standard for our waiting sessions. Our last job of the day is to head over to the North Plaza once again, checking the clock tower for reference on your time and then navigating the angry hordes of undead at night. Remember, they do get a bit buffed up as soon as it gets laid. Once you're through those shambling bodies, head to the gun shop. This time, there's actually going to be a psychopath in there, the familiar Cletus. And just use the normal door cheese method and then lock yourself inside for another big wait. This mad lad is actually going to drop us cooked steak, wine and a grapefruit. Combined with what you've already got, you're setting yourself up for a good good few hours. We have no clock in here for reference sadly so it's all guesswork on your part here unless you find one to check in another shop outside. We are in for the long haul and the halfway point soon. You guessed it, pop that Netflix back on, grab a cuppa and just give it some time. At this point we have really capitalised on survivors and psychos and all the benefits they bring and by now you should be able to handle yourself when it comes to this, but also running low on food is likely for the first time as day 3 enters, and as it's around 9am this is when you'll start feeling a bit more peckish. But do not fret my fellow Frank West stands, we have a cunning plan. However, first I want to prove a point about the naughty fellows parading in a car. As you can see none of them drop food, but they do drop weapons. Around this time, you want to be in Leisure Park anyway and check the clock. Take note and then head into the food court as this is really the only safe time to use this area. In the past there has been bugs of this game freezing at this area in day 4. But as I want this guy to be usable across the board for most platforms, whether you're playing on PS4, PS5, Xbox, PC, whatever. I will be avoiding the food court in totality for day 4, so we're doing it today. We're going to spend a lot of time here in day 3, drinking wine and relaxing with the lovely ambiance before abandoning it for a while. So stock up on that wine, snacks and treats, then take root in the dining zone, forming a barricade as we have the biggest time sink in the game right now. Now as mentioned, this is to protect your run, but feel free to use day 3 to explore for fun, more enemies or more food if you need to. As I've mentioned, this guide is pretty malleable, this is just the safest bet for your run. Just keep your wits about you and make sure to head back to the security room before 7pm. Once there, it's time to do more standing around until midnight, and we know by now you love clock watching. It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more. Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services 
It's time to stop! So day four has arrived and you've made it this far, so well done. This section is what I like to call Frank's Midnight Mission. We have two target soldiers. From the security room after midnight, head up to the heliport and lay waste to Todd. But do be cautious, for some reason he can withstand even Buster Blast more than most bosses in the game. No idea why, but he does drop some goodies. Directly after this, head back down to the unwelded door, go through that path and into the entrance plaza. From there you can take care of lovely Simone. She will drop even more white gold, the fabled milk we dream of at this point to get us through the days. And after this, you'll need to pick up any more food you need from the entrance plaza. But do not go too crazy, head back to the security room and do some more clock watching. You know by now, you know the gist, after day three it's a lot of waiting. I also decided at this point to change up my clothes once again and make Frank a true fashionista. Then we waited some more and at this point any change to the monotony of 7 day survival will keep you sane so do what you need to do whether it's watch a film, watch a show, go and sit somewhere in the garden with your alarm on and keep coming back to the game, whatever gets you through the next couple of days. As it hits around midday on day 4, you will want to head back into the Paradise Plaza section and make your way to the second floor between the food place and the sports shop. A survivor will spawn here giving you a bonus snack to start the day. And also, grab those two jugs of OJ from the Roast Masters just next door, just in case. As my patience was starting to wane here, I decided to actually do some freeform exploring while still avoiding the food court just in case of the freeze bug. I was not taking any chances obviously. Heading to the North Plaza I did stumble upon Brett, another survivor outside Carlito's hideout just before the gunshot and he luckily dropped a cooked pizza. We hit the jackpot here so definitely follow this plan. After stashing those 12 inches away, behave, I made my way further into the plaza. I wanted to show you how the supermarket itself is closed. There's no extended help given here, as that place would have totally broke the immersion and the game of Infinity Mode with just grabbing food off the shelves. But it is what it is. After that, I decided to randomly shave Frank's head and make way back to the security room. That boredom was setting in. I was also shocked to see my safe haven had been completely invaded by the zombies. And it's a key point to remember that from day 4, you can be killed even in here. It's not that safe haven anymore. Next, you guessed it, waiting, 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 till it hits midnight and day 5 begins. Again, these are the safest ways to play the game to not get killed. You can freeform explore at any point and find loads more survivors or psychos. I'm just doing a bit of the middle ground for this guy. Congratulations my fellow Frank West and Hank Easts. You made it to day 5. And for that benefit you've unlocked the 5 day survivor trophy and gained Fantastic. the laser sword. Fantastic! A super handy extra melee weapon of the end game power variety. Even if you fail from here you have made amazing progress so well done. Honestly, this is such a slog. Well done. The finish line is in sight though. This is another point in your run where you can freely explore for other survivors and psychos for extra challenge, food or weapons. I was pretty stocked so I played it safe but I grabbed some wine from the North Plaza and I was saving it for a rainy day as I was getting quite anxious at this late stage of anything could happen. As I imagine, you all will be too. During my downtime, I did see a rather dark connotation of how this game was making me feel, hanging from the rafters above. Enough said. And I also questioned how Frank has asbestos hands, as he could hold roasting hot steaks with no pain. This guy is on another level. But maybe I was just starting to lose my sanity altogether, as I had been doing this for 8 hours straight at this point, with no break. Man, you gotta give me something. 
Side note, you can actually put modern consoles into rest mode and pause and keep it like churning along and come back to it daily, but I just wanted this done. My eyes were starting to become heavy. It was time for another Buster restock after a few hours of waiting in that winery back room. So we headed to the security room and ventured out. To my actual surprise, I found two survivors, one outside the vent and one on the helipad. They just keep coming back. Bonus snacks I also appreciated at this stage for the extra security on my health. I was also praying I would not get a PS5 crash at this point, we don't need a grey screen, and the old girl was bossing it, no noise, no heat, she was getting through. As we approached the last day, I decided to swap into Frank's default threads just to spice up my boring playtime session at this point, and then after a few more in-game hours, I wandered out to the entrance plaza, readying myself for the final push. However, I was actually shocked to see the Sniper family had respawned. Initially I was quite worried about this because they took me by surprise. But I realised that this meant three bonus cooked pizzas minimum. What a result! And after killing them, I just locked myself in the antique store and settled in for the long haul. I do recommend for day five taking it very easy grabbing more food wherever you can and setting up shops somewhere safe, but keep in mind the entrance plaza has the most going on towards the final two days. We were truly coming to the tail end of this monumental challenge and I could smell and see and feel the finish line. It was insane. You're a hard man to find, Galen, but farming. Really? Man of your talents? It's a peaceful life. It's lonely, I imagine. My fellow zombie champions, we are at literally the final hurdle. And by far, unfortunately, the most boring section of the game you'll experience and that I agree with personally. I spend 80% of my time locked up worrying about even venturing outside at the risk of such a late game failure occurring. Again, it's very up to you if you want to explore, but at this point, it's a real risk. I was clock washing over and over, hoping somehow the game could just keep going and not crash on me. As you can tell, I was getting increasingly anxious. Again though, you are free to explore as I've mentioned. But only go and grab more food if you need it. Avoid any confrontation, as it's way too risky. So, we wait, we dig in, and we eat. Over and over until the boredom finally broke me, unfortunately. And, yeah, I was contradicting the words I'm saying now. After a good few in-game hours, I think it was about 6 to 12, um, I was even getting bored of watching Netflix at this point, I just wanted to go to bed. And I felt so fed up and my brain was fried, so even the love of Dead Rising as a franchise could not keep me standing still, listening to groans of zombies and more music for almost another 11 hours of playtime, which worked out to about another hour of actual real lifetime. I chose to explore and I changed into a lovely white fitted suit for my last hurrah. I dyed my hair grey to showcase how Frank's stress had aged him in just six days as well. Now I wandered further into Al Fresca, you know the worst place possible to ever be in this game at any time? It was a very big brain move by me. David, another survivor, shocked me, luckily he had nothing at long range. He was a random bonus that offered me yoghurt and also two bottles of orange juice that were sat behind him at the food stall. I was now beyond stocked with food, overflowing even, so I chose to entrench myself there for a few more hours just for some new scenery. But I also wasted some of the food out of being impatient and keeping my health up. I needed my inventory to be stocked and I hated leaving the food on the floor. I waited and waited before choosing to return to the entrance plaza for the final hunkering down. I'm not leaving again after this, and neither should you. <laughs> the funny thing is though, I won't even lie, at this point I was almost cocky. 
probably because of the brain fog and being tired, but day six had one last surprise for me, and it nearly took everything. I decided to change my outfit again, because my ADHD brain rot cannot decide what appeases it best within 30 minute periods, and this decision led me to explore at the main entrance. Well, this almost cost me my entire 12 hour and 6 day run. Yes. Surprise! The worst psycho in the game, Carlito, with his 50 caliber big boy gun, started chunking my health down out of nowhere to dangerous levels, so I panicked like mad and hid behind a pillar, force feeding Frank like he was drunkenly eating a kebab at 2am. Edging closer around the pillars, I finally got enough shots off to take down this annoying SOB, let's not say the other word, yes SOB, for the last time. Nabbing his final food offerings and running back to my fabled antique store that I used on the 360 days. The end was approaching and my heart was literally in my throat. Learn from my lessons everyone, do not take the risks. Do not take the risks out of boredom, play it safe and just wait. Watch some more Dead Rising content on my channel why don't you? <laughs> These final moments of the 7 day survival challenge felt kind of surreal. I remember back on the 360 days getting all the achievements when I was about 14 and I loved the original Dead Rising. I spent hours and hours and hours on it. It was the only game I ever got a thousand G on. I have vivid memories of the Saint run, getting those eight women to follow me at once, the zombie genocide of spending like eight to twelve hours just mowing over zombies. But for some reason, my brain had completely blocked out this seven day run. It was a weird thought that a decade and a, and a half I was here again, and so are you. I decided to clock watch in the last in game hours. Then I got bored again, started smashing windows in the shop. Then I found a weird trippy mirror effect Frank was messing around with in the, my looniness in the mirror. And yeah, that just this is this is the levels of boredom I was facing, guys. It was 1 a.m. in the UK. The seventh day was approaching, and at this point, I did not care about even completing it. I was pretty much hallucinating at this point and wanting to smash my phone because the alarm had been repeating three times an hour for 14 hours. I just had enough. It was 11.50pm in Dead Rising itself, and this feeling began to wash over me, and hopefully it will with you too. We were about to beat the hardest and most tedious trophy in the game, and in a matter of seconds, it was just done. I was ecstatic, but it was all over, and a flood of melatonin just hit my brain like a tsunami. I took Frank from that store, back to Paradise Plaza, confirming the time was past seven days on screen by entering a new area. This is an important step as you need to die to end the challenge, do not return to the title screen. I then kind of, I don't know, half-hazardly let myself get killed. I allowed the first zombies I saw to just eat my tired and whittled flesh and fill their bellies, but as we know, they are never full. We had survived seven days in the outbreak of Willamette. How's that for a slice of fried gold? Yeah, boy! And with that, the challenge is over, and so is the video. Thank you to everyone who watched along and had a laugh with me, watching me in pain, and to everyone that was following along and actually getting guidance and tips from this. Massive, massive congratulations for no matter how far you got, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven days. It can take a few times to actually get the method down, so don't beat yourself up about it. As much as I moaned and got bored during this challenge, I actually loved it. I love Dead Rising, and I cannot wait for the remaster next month. If you made it to the end of the video, 
whether you did the challenge or not, let me know your favourite zombie film and zombie game. I'd love to know. For me, it's obviously Dead Rising and Shaun of the Dead. The two marry up so well. But yeah, that's the trilogy of Dead Rising's original videos done on the channel now. And in the future, you will see some live streams going towards the Platinum and also coverage of Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster. Other than that, you can look out for my Soul Reaver retrospective in the future as well. But as for this challenge, it is very much indeed like you're trapped in a time loop, especially because I'm going to have to do this all over again next month when the Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster releases. Pray for me. Sunshine, Sammy!